Blue Horizon asks, might as well get my question in for your upcoming Q&A. How did you get started using YouTube and what persuaded you to make videos on the site? I first learned about YouTube from my brother in 2006 who was making videos for the site which you will never get to see now. At this point I was already streaming from several other online services such as Stupid Videos, Meta Cafe, and Newgrounds. Yeah, this was back when YouTube wasn't a completely dominant video service that many people treated as their primary outlet. That year, I only watched videos on YouTube, such as speedruns, amateur sketches, and whatever other awesome or lousy creations came up. It was easy to find something radically new and different back then. The following year in April, I decided to open up my own account and started making whatever videos I could possibly come up with for it. They all sucked. I don't have many of my early videos in my possession anymore in part due to them being quick captures since I found YouTube's uploader to be cumbersome. Either that or the uploads were always just too slow back then. And I wasn't using dial-up, mind you. It's hard to describe what my first channel was like as I pretty much uploaded whatever I wanted entirely from spontaneous ideas rather than trying to carefully plan out and craft something meaningful. Any projects that were too ambitious for me were quickly abandoned as I often wanted to make my videos in only a day. Some videos I made include but are not limited to the following. Talking about someone else's video, recording gameplay footage with a camera, doing a skit about a microwave clock not being set, making domino rallies, Rube Goldbergs, and trying to invent reusable wall dominoes, techno phone dialing, Something made with pivot, and music made with my mouth. Those are a few of the things I can show you without displaying my face. Later on I started watching Smosh and felt really compelled to try making comedy videos. Most every single one of them turned out to be a train wreck, as you may have guessed, but every single one of them was necessary to create in order to slowly but surely build up the experience and skills necessary to create Arowana. I would like to go into more detail about my upbringing on YouTube as well as my experience with the years 2006 to 2009 in general. That'll probably be for another rambling in another video, at least if anyone is interested in that era. I'm sure a lot of you are already nostalgic about it. Every now and then I have this tendency to binge on my old pictures and videos. You'll see plenty of them throughout this video. Attila asks, Well, I have a question. What computers do you have right now? Look plus config wise and what PC parts which aren't in computer right now? The majority of my computers have 440BX slot 1 motherboards, but do cover a somewhat wide range of platforms, including a couple Socket 5 motherboards, Socket 7 motherboards of varying chipsets, 440LX slot 1 boards, a couple dual Socket 8 boards, as well as Socket 370 boards, all too well compatible. There are a lot of parts which aren't in any of my computers right now either because I don't want to use them or I don't have enough cases to throw them in. Radeon Eagle 606 Silver Generations asks, What is the difference between a toaster and a potato in terms of Windows gaming? I don't think we should be comparing toasters and potatoes. They're just not the same thing, even less related to each other than apples and oranges. You could put potato slices in a toaster oven, but I'm not sure how good that would turn out. Hey Hernandez 94 asks, How is the Hierma project going? When can we test it for ourselves? You already know this, but Beta 1.1b is available for download at a link in the description. For those of you who don't know, Hierma is my pet project, which is basically a set of bash scripts used to aid in the installation of Windows 9X. 
whether it's run directly on the target computer or from another one. You can use Hierma to directly prepare a hard disk for installing an operating system or create a custom install CD. You can even use it to preload extracted drivers, which can save you at least 10 minutes. Benjamin Go asks, Will you do a compilation of It's Now Safe to Turn Off Your Computer Screens on Windows 95, 98, and ME Computers? No, I don't make compilations of other people's content. Sauce Mercury Networks asks, What is your favorite Windows beta? Chicago is a pretty cool series of Windows pre-release builds because it displays the exhaustive transition from a rather clunky to use DOS program to a highly advanced operating system. But my favorite is definitely Memphis, particularly builds 1387, 1423, and 1518. Not only do they not have the mess that is Internet Explorer 4, but some of their components can be backported to Windows 95B without too much effort. If you want gradient title bars in Windows 95B, overwrite the system files user.exe, user32.dll, gdi.exe, gdi32.dll, and shell.dll with the ones coming from Memphis 1387, then overwrite the files desk.cpl and deskcp16.dll with those from Memphis 1423. You could copy the control panel from 1387, but the one from 1423 is much more intuitive as changing gradients works exactly the same as in Windows 98 and onward. I've been using those files along with several others to create a so-called Windows 95D, a reverse 98 Lite, so to speak. Mork asks, how many machines do you actually have at home? It's grown to around 50 as of now. Many of them are not complete though, and given how much room these machines are taking up, I think I'd rather focus on filling them up, especially with power supplies. Jellyfish asks, Why are you so awesome? What is your favorite Windows OS? When did you start making videos? To answer your first question, I'm not, and for the second one, I did answer Windows 95, NT4, and 98 in my last Q&A, but 98 has significantly fallen out of favor since I found I can do everything I need to do in Windows 95 anyway. Windows 95 is a lot snappier, though a lack of back and forward buttons in its non-IE Explorer interface does prove to be an annoyance if I'm working in many directories at once. If the Explorers from 95 and Nashville could be merged together, that would be perfect. Your third question has been answered at the start of this video. So Jeff V. Logan asks, Do you like the Windows NT 4.0 startup sound? Yeah, it's really cool. I won't sleep easy until I get the original 44 kilohertz copy of the Windows 95 startup sound, though. Even though I've sworn to be inactive on Twitter indefinitely, I tweeted to Brian Ano asking if he has it. My question seems to have fallen flat, but if more people ask around, we might be able to get it. Reality Engine 2 asks, Why'd you remove the 32-bit difference from your channel? I removed it because the stock background I used was being tagged for copyright by some third party I don't recognize. It's not tagged right now, but I do plan to re-upload it with an animated background of my own labor around the same time I start working on a new Jimbo video. Thanks for asking me this question. I was under the impression that nobody cared about the 32-bit difference anymore. Bez Granigsny Granny asks, is the Bass still using his PC? I really don't know. If he is, nobody will get to see it anymore because this whole concept of whacking a keyboard with a fish plush repeatedly has gotten so stale and I'd rather not make any more videos about that so as to not compromise the integrity of the three videos I do have uploaded. George Whittlesback Lorraine McLarion Hoopy asks, what happened to the maroon whales? How is the oversquid doing? The current status of most of the maroon whales is ambiguous as there has never really been a confirmed report of the existence of any maroon whales since the surfacing of Koji in 1998. And even before then, no maroon whales had ever revealed themselves. Same goes with the oversquid. But the maroon whales and the oversquid have strong conflicts of interest, and as such, I do not care about the oversquid, and he is irrelevant, and everyone hates him. Strikernaut asks, 
Do you have any Risk Unix workstation like SunSpark, Digital Equipment, Silicon Graphics, HP, PA Risk? You also have any Amiga? Unfortunately, I don't. I would really like to get an Amiga computer of some sort, but don't really know how exactly I should approach them. If I find some kind of Amiga box at a thrift store for cheap, I'll be sure to get it. I did see an HP 9000 Unix workstation in person, complete with peripherals and software, but the store I was at was asking $300 for that thing. Better than eBay, I'm sure, but... Not something I want to shell out for some totally new platform. I'm not sure what I'll use it for. TrolleyMC asks, What is the best way to start a retro server project like yours? You can start with pretty much any old computer you want. It was common practice for the same motherboards to be used as desktops and servers back then. If you want something more specialized, I'd consider anything that has two or more CPU sockets or slots and or an... EISA bus or a 64-bit PCI slot to be server or workstation hardware. If you expect to run your server 24-7, which is not advisable given how inefficient they are by today's standards, make sure your hardware can support ECC memory, just as if you were setting up a modern 24-7 server. The hardware and applications you'll use on your server will ultimately depend on your specific needs and tastes. SackCody013 asks, How about make Hardcore Windows Millennium Edition? I shall reaffirm that there will not be any more Hardcore Windows videos. Hardcore Windows 95 was made at a time when I didn't want to use my voice due to how off-putting it was. A year later it stabilized into something I could tolerate a lot more and that allowed me to pack a lot more explanation into my videos, making Hardcore Windows increasingly obsolete. Of course, I'd definitely make videos without voice commentary down the road, but the other problem with Hardcore Windows is its outliers. I always intended for Hardcore Windows to be viewed as a series, but certain videos end up getting far more views than others, often leaving new viewers alienated on whatever context is behind them. Segment 7 of Hardcore Windows NT has this robot voice talking about how I'm going to hell or whatever after the series is over, but nobody would understand why I'm doing this unless they've been working their way from the third segment where I started adding more spots of humor into the series as a way to keep otherwise dull videos engaging. Then I made Hardcore Windows XP as a fun little treat for my then 300 subscribers who had the context of Hardcore Windows NT handy. That video blew up way out of proportion, far beyond what I would have liked it to be. Yeah, it's actually an awful thing that video got almost 3 million views because it's led to many people getting all these false impressions of me. I don't normally treat computers the way I did in there. That was just an exaggerated recreation of the experience I had when that same computer was upgraded from Windows 98 Second Edition to Windows XP back in 2002. A lot of the cool things I knew in 98 were gone and I wanted to go back. Good Player 1808 asks, what is your favorite game? From a critical standpoint, Gimmick still tops out as my favorite game for all the innovation it delivers in a small package on old hardware. Next to them are Unreal and G. Darius, the latter being one of many side-scrolling shooting games that's so underrated in the West. I'm not a gamer, though. These days, I only play Quake 2 on TastySpleen.net from time to time to get my stimulation from a short burst of fast-paced Twitch action. The Railgun is the best weapon ever created for a game, as with careful aim, it can frag an opponent in one hit if they haven't picked up extra armor or health. Very satisfying. PC Band Inc. asks, Coming soon to a cinema near you! Yes, but what is the movie? Liam555 asks, Do you like Windows 10? I absolutely despise Windows 10. It is, without a shadow of a doubt, the worst operating system of all time. Windows 10 symbolizes the decay of the freedom and functionality the desktop computer provided to users, as its integrated spyware, 
forced updates and installations of a blatant diamond mine ripoff, along with this incident called Update 1809, should make it classified as malware. I'm not exaggerating. If the press could be upset about Windows ME and Vista, despite such operating systems not actually being that bad if you have the right hardware and drivers for them, they should be on fire against Windows 10. Dylan Thids YT asks, Why is your sub count disabled? I disabled my subscriber count because it didn't accurately reflect the viewership of my videos. Before I disabled the count, I already had 10,000 subscribers, but it took three weeks for Arowana to reach 1,000 views, and it certainly hasn't experienced any growth spike since the initial one resulting from it first being published. This, after I had spent at least a couple months total working on it, including one or two weeks on the intro alone, what with all the random computer footage I had to record, but not the days I put off the project. I started in the middle of 2008, finished it in early 2009, and held it back until September simply because I wasn't ready to publish it. I get the feeling that the majority of my subscribers have only compulsively subscribed to my channel through hardcore Windows XP after being groomed so much into subscribing to so many channels that they will never be able to keep up with, begging viewers to like, comment, and subscribe at the end of every video is grossly irresponsible because it doesn't regard the bigger picture. How much do you value a YouTube channel? Are you really willing to sit through every single one of its new videos? If you can't keep up with it, why bother subscribing? Besides that, most of my views don't come from subscription feeds. They come from recommendations which the soulless YouTube algorithm decides on. If my average view count per video could match or exceed my subscriber count, I'd be willing to show my subscriber count again. Perhaps when YouTube actually starts to fix their whole subscriber thing, which seems to have been an ongoing problem for years. Moment Lover 1200 asks, Is Beige Dream my favorite video on your channel? It depends on what you think. Mini Keanu Reeves asks, Do you have any tips when buying old computers, and which computer did you use to edit your videos? If available, the best place to start looking for old computers is always going to be a thrift store or a garage sale, as they are generally sold for really cheap, with notable exceptions. Otherwise, reserve some money to get one online, preferably not too expensive. Also, make sure to test the power supply with a separate power supply tester with all other devices unplugged when you get it. You can never really trust that a power supply at least 20 years old won't fry something when you powered it on. Generally, I only use one computer for editing my videos, being my Ryzen 7 2700 system. Adobe Premiere Pro CS6 has been a very reliable video editor in collaboration with several other Adobe programs for the past six years. Quite a shame that they found this obsession to force a subscription-only model after CS6. TV Joshtron asks, What's your favorite video you made? I have a hard time deciding between Arowana and the 32-bit difference. I'll most likely change my answer to something else once I make that thing. No Sleep asks, Do you have old Linux workstations? Hardly. I've been running Debian 10 on this IBM Think Center, which serves as a dedicated develop machine for Hierma. That's hardly something I'd call old, even though the computer is from 2005 or 2006. Apart from that, I don't have any Linux workstations handy, but I do have a box copy of Red Hat 5.2. I was the one who removed the shrink wrap. Scalaboo asks, how's the economy? The economy sucks. 987 Computer asks, When did you start collecting old PCs hardware? My habit of collecting old PC hardware kicked off in 2012 when I wanted to beef up my grandpa's 486 computer he gave me, though I have found myself quite enthusiastic about old computers for nearly all my life. I could say I've had that enthusiasm even as early as 2002 following the abrupt upgrade from Windows 98 to XP on the K7M. 
As I've said before, I always wanted to go back to the former and got my chance to do so on various occasions when I visited my grandma's house. The compact Rosario over there also had Windows 98 on it and became sort of a zen for me. Early in 2005, I got to keep the Presario in my bedroom along with a Windows 95 laptop manufactured by Sharp. Ah, so this is that Windows 95 the other Design Force sticker was talking about. I typed up a lot of nonsensical documents and recorded a bunch of sounds on these computers, but they are lost forever because I stupidly decided to give them up after figuring they were no good because the Presario's hard drive was full from what I vaguely recall, which must be why I couldn't save any settings or documents. And I spilled milk and cereal all over the Sharp laptop a few times. The laptop still worked, but the keyboard became too difficult to type on. If only I had considered the personal long-term value of my creations from then. I know some people could have helped me copy them over to a safe spot if I had just asked them. Panoro Charlton asks, What is your personal opinion on the Eternal King of Soy? Is he a good leader? Is the Eternal King of Soy a leader at all? People claim to take orders from him all the time, but no verified records of these orders exist. Either way, Soy is an awesome counterculture product, but the Soy King is boring. Tonko301 asks, What was your first computer which you ever owned? The first computer I truly owned was an iBook G4 I got for Christmas of 2003. However, when I digitized my parents' WA tapes, I found out they owned a 486 machine from 1996 to 1998, which was first purchased by my uncle in 1992 and shipped off to make room for the Packard Bell Legend 994 CDT, which was then given to my dad a few years later. The same Packard Bell has been in my possession up until a year ago, but I don't know what happened to the 486 after it was stored in a basement for a few years. All I know is that it's long gone for sure, and hardly any recordings of it exist. None of them emphasize the computer itself, as in typical suburban family fashion, all family recordings only ever focus on the kids. Very, very annoying. Of course, that 486 is not to be confused with my grandpa's 486, which I still have most of the hardware for. Tech 101 asks, Windows XP or Windows ME? Well, isn't it obvious? Only one can be better. Now, Wage asks, Which operating system do you use for your daily tasks? I still use Windows 7, even being fully aware of its ticking doomsday clock. However, I'm not going to hold out on Windows 7. I'm testing an escape route known as FreeBSD, and I'm trying to learn how to use, or install sometimes, free alternatives to the Adobe programs I've been relying on for so long. This entire answer video was narrated in Audacity under FreeBSD 12.1 Stable and edited using Kden Live. Boxridder999 asks, Do you like bread? Yes. DDPPE9955 asks, Is that you speak other languages? No, well, not yet, I guess. I haven't really made time to learn other languages kind of had uh, Russian in mind, actually. But, I mean, if you count programming languages, I probably speak a few. 4Bits asks, How do I use the computer? Try a free sample from Video Professor today, and if you're not satisfied, please return the DVDs as quickly as possible, or you'll get charged big time. Is anyone going to get this? Mon asks, do you happen to have any interest in old PowerPC or 68K Macintosh computers? Back in 2007 up to 2009, I really wanted to collect old Macs, but never got any in that time frame, even as my school was preparing to haul out something like 30 or more all-in-one Power Macintoshes from uh, like 96, 97 maybe? 
If I recall correctly, they wouldn't let me take one for some dumb arbitrary reason. Maybe it was like regulatory shit. Nowadays, I don't find myself into them too much. But I do happen to have four complete PowerPC Macs. All of them with G3 CPUs. Still, a 68K Macintosh of some sort would be really cool to have. Wise asks, just woke up. Where is Aqua Speaksters, bro? <laughs> Aqua is dead. <laughs> uh, Islam King Gamer asks, can you do an upgrade from Windows 95 to Windows XP and play Quake? I could do a downgrade from Windows XP to 95 and play Quake. But I can't say I've ever had time for requests. Hi Majestic asks, do you like cheeseburgers? No, they come from the cheese ghost and I hate the cheese ghost. Mr. Netch asks, how do you use the computer if you live underwater? Why does everyone keep accusing me of being a whale or something? All I do is make videos. I don't know how whales use computers underwater. I suppose they would use large keyboards or deliver voice commands and sometimes use uh, pH neutral <laughs> hardware. Most hardware is not pH neutral because manufacturers like to cheap out to maximize profit when selling computers to whales. Gotta have those Latin components, man. Official and Andre asks, what did inspire you to make videos about old computers? Not much in particular, actually. While I had recorded videos of old computers previously, I didn't think much about publishing them until early 2014. I thought to make a video having to do with an old computer mainly as just another one of my spontaneous ideas and a never-ending struggle to find ways to grow my YouTube channel. It was only a few months after I made Gibble vs Noobs, which was the first time I started to grapple with some level of competence in producing videos, after a series of train wreck ventures earlier in 2013. Given I had already been messing with my collection of three old computers quite a bit, I knew I could prepare some alright setups with them, but how I would present them was a question yet to be clearly answered. Which is why my first computer videos largely don't look much different from most others out there. Casual tripodless camera handling in front of a computer. This, of course, is a very boring style, so I tried editing some epilogue-ish backstory to my 486 as well as throw in what I originally considered to be a running creepypasta side story just to spice things up. While I have continued to try other things, some which ended up never seeing the light of day, I did take notice to the enthusiasm some very small portion of viewers had for my computers back when I was truly a nobody. Thanks to my continued focus on old computers, and some other things maybe, I'm not completely a nobody anymore, but definitely not someone I'd call famous as I've heard some people tell me. Excitecho Reese asks, What's your favorite obscure data storage disk? I haven't really used anything that could be called an obscure data storage medium to give an answer to that. The closest thing I can come up with is those Trevan QIC tape drives. I had one that shared the floppy interface, but they can also connect using a parallel, IDE, or SCSI interface. Unfortunately, most QIC drives aren't compatible with Windows 95's built-in backup utility, but Windows 95 does have broader device support which allowed me to use mine. Some tape drives using a floppy interface can connect to a dedicated floppy controller specifically designed to provide double the bandwidth of a normal one, but I may have broken mine. Either way, I don't have any of those things anymore. Mattac93 asks, is the earth flat? No. Fodcom asks, still doing push-ups? Plan to do any collabs in the future? To answer your first question, yes, I still do push-ups. It has essentially become a compulsion for me to work out in some way, 
or else my stomach feels all rusty and greasy and anything else that isn't good. I can't really put it into words correctly, but, you know, guy exercise. As for your second question, no, I am not willing to collaborate with you anymore because I find myself having great difficulty in associating with someone who regularly attacks others for their differences. However, if you make active efforts to change your ways for the better, I would be willing to join forces with you again. Keaton Spence asks, What's your opinion on the current Windows end user license agreement? It's just Microsoft being Microsoft like any other copyright hawk or telephone company. Windows 6208 asks, How many computers and laptops do you have? Again, I have around 50 computers, but I tend to avoid collecting laptops due to some of them having proprietary interfaces for different things, batteries that are absurdly difficult to replace because they're just not making them anymore. It's been long past that. And in some cases, laptops might have this plastic that finds a way to snap apart. That's why you never see my WinBook XL being used for anything anymore. It was a beautiful passive matrix laptop otherwise. I would be interested in getting another laptop, but don't know where to turn. Coccolino2007 asks, If Windows would disappear, what OS would you move on? Uh, FreeBSD? I wouldn't lose too much sleep if Windows disappeared. Well, as long as it's like the newer ones. Dio Kasparov asks, Where's Rogamp? At May 1998, Mr. and Mrs. Twit started a new daycare. It was called the Very Nice Playtime Daycare Center of Doom. It looked like a playhouse, but only the Twits could go in the moonwalks and ball pits. Kids had to do difficult chores, which was very annoying. The Twits wanted to babysit for Boy Pie because the birds and mugglewumps had left. The first person ever to go in the daycare center was Fudge. During the day to cause trouble, the Twits would put hug tight sticky glue in the ball pit and moonwalks. It was not nice. Fudge had enough with the chores. He went in the ball pit. Then all the balls were stuck to Fudge, even on his eyes. Fudge screamed and the Twits were laughing at him. They said, na 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 na. 25 seconds later, Fudge had an idea. He could go to the circus. The hostess said, Hey, Fudge, you look great. You got to be the clown. The Twits were mad as they saw where Fudge was going. They ran in, but got pushed back to the daycare. Striker505 asks, What is your plan of attack against mega corporations like Google seeking to micromanage and consolidate the net? I do not have any solid tactics of my own that I can provide, but as is common practice, you can attempt to limit the venues Google has to monetize you and your activities on the internet. Install ad and script blockers, sign up for a VPN if you can afford to, and use DuckDuckGo as a first resort for finding what you want. Favor services that don't sell your activities to advertisers if at all possible. If such services require you to pay money and you have an abundance of wealth to expend, use them. Apply pressure to corporations against doing their usual rounds of screwing everything up and make them feel it in whatever ways you can. By the way, I'm on Vlare. Check my channel out. It's a good YouTube alternative. Kretnak asks, Do more Krebe! You know, I do actually have a third Booger King installment in mind and a much more solid plan for what it would be like. Unfortunately, that's going to require me to learn how to use 3DS Max to a greater extent so that I can render my things on a Pentium 2 workstation, and I haven't made so much time to get around to that. Programming has to come first these days. Shuik asks, do you play Minecraft? No. Nora Nora asks, Who are you? 
What your name? How old are you? Why are you predicting the future? Are you timer travel guy? HCE asks, how much old software do you have? In regards to physical software, I haven't bothered counting since I more so tend to install programs to computers over the network. Um, I don't want that asks. What is your favorite operating systems? What are your favorite computer brands? I generally avoid OEM hardware, opting for the greater flexibility which is more often provided by motherboards manufactured for system builders which could be anything like Asus, A-Bit, AOPEN, Gigabyte, Biostar, FIC, Tyan, Supermicro, MSI, sometimes Intel, and really whatever else doesn't try to create a sandbox system in some form. Even so, there are OEM computers I would be pretty interested in keeping for myself. I was collecting Dell towers for a while, but grew cynical of their proprietary power supply connectors, even though adapters do exist for them. Micron would almost certainly be a brand computer I'd love to have, as they use the same internal chassis as Dell without the extra power supply hassles. Gateway 2000's computers are pretty robust too. Many of you may have seen my P5133 in action. It doesn't have L2 cache, but I'm not willing to give that up anytime soon. Other industrial grade computers such as those from Compaq or Hewlett Packard would also be solid additions to my collection. Undefined asks, do you do UO Sorry. Know about Joe? He's a pretty cool guy. Hey. Aust's a website. He has epic Ooh, that's a gross word. And cool fun my videos and pictures smiley face his site is Joe's site dot Joe the links to funny s is Joe site dot Joe slash Joe funnies Al files is prefixed with Joe funny and end with incrementing number he has 800 funnies I laugh at all of them happy visit him pre he's pretty cool he knows a lot of HTML his site looks pretty OMG my god I just told your friend about Joe and my friend's and wow, he's pretty cool. And I said, me too. And then he downloaded cool files for his cool computer to make it cooler than a cool, cool bus in the cool, cool streets. Happy? Smiley? Which one is it? Uh, he told me about Targa files and how to custom mom. Custom noise windows me to not crashed. He made my I, me stirs very stable. Colon right parentheses. I don't get crashes anymore with she s good by. Tia we a visitor Joe he's Gret <laughs> Aesthetic GT Gaming asks Windows XP on Intel Pentium 1. You know that's not going to happen. Raven Rampkin asks the following questionnaires. Ah uh, the usual ones probably. Yeah, yeah. Why remove the sub count? You're local. Uh, when and why did you start voicing over your dids? Or rather, why did you keep silent from the start? What makes you so surreal of a channel? Seriously, drug on giraffe, better go cry in the corner. Do you have a special recipe? Or is it just being yourself? 
Nothing personal. Up to you to answer or not answer. Regards, upside down, smiley. Question two is of America continent. Is three is because I didn't like my voice earlier, but it got slightly better a couple of years after the completion of puberty. Fourth question is answered like this. Sometimes I get tired of making computers and want to venture into other things, even if their production value turns out to be shoddy. Even when I'm making computer videos, I sometimes want to throw something a little weird in, that's all. In 1983, I made a computer program that destroyed a tape cassette as a prank for Timothy. Unfortunately, it is mechanically impossible for a computer to destroy a tape cassette, so all it prints out is delete. Ing. I ended up eating the cassette shell, but left the magnetic tape B in case he had data on there that was bound to data retention regulations. I never heard from Timothy again. Later that night, he called my phone and said, Yo, do you want to go to the arcade? I said, Fuck you. Video games are boring. Timothy plowed through my house with a Zamboni and pretended to be the asshole from The Shining but couldn't scare me. I bribed him with the Twix like he was some renegade dragon that could be easily tamed with food so he would drive away from my house, but he told me, Fuck you! Eat your own goddamn Twix! He clearly expected me to tremble in fear of his one-liner, but I knew this was another one of his pretentious pranks. So you know what I did? I punished him with a capital prank. Do you know what the capital prank is? Ice cream. Yep. Just that. Ice cream. Not in the face, or grabbing the top of the cone at a drive-thru. Just presenting a bowl of ice cream, and masochistically grinning at him, knowing he's not allowed to take it under penalty of DEATH. Red Violet asks, what are your predictions for the future of computing? You seem to prefer to look backwards to older hardwares and operating systems. Is this because of a disillusionment with the dumbing down of computing to cater to the normie masses? Is there hope for nerds like you and your fans to maintain an independent computing culture long term without corporate homogenization placing a ceiling on functionality? That's not far off from my views on the current state of technology as a whole, especially when you take into account how so-called smartphones have essentially removed many of the philosophies that made desktop computing special, and is now trying to push its own fundamentally broken philosophies back onto the desktop. With smartphones, the concepts of having total control of your device and true privacy are made to sound taboo and criminal. Devices need to constantly receive updates which add more things that are most likely not going to be useful and your phone is going to be left unusable until it finishes going through the entire update procedure. Government and corporate spyware are integral to modern phones which is the real purpose of adding more processing power and battery life to succeeding generations of phones. When people figured out the battery could be removed to go dark when the phone's not being used, batteries in major phone brands stopped being removable. As mentioned earlier, Windows 10 pushes many of these philosophies to the desktop computer in whatever ways it can. While many Windows 10 users who've previously used Windows 7 or earlier are definitely feeling the effects of them, many of them have also become complacent with Windows 10's antics. They'll look back at Windows Me, Vista, and 8 saying how awful they were, but they don't pay attention to how much worse Windows 10 truly is, and it's very disheartening to see Windows 7's market share losing so much ground to Windows 10 over the last few months. I see my somewhat regular usage of Windows 95 as a statement against Microsoft's pressure it applies to everyone, saying they absolutely must upgrade to the latest version of Windows to do a little something. How necessary is it to upgrade, really? What do I get from this new version of Windows that I simply cannot get with Windows 95? If you're inclined to mention a more stable architecture all around, then yes, there is a reason to get a different operating system. Windows NT 4.0 has that stability one would want. 
Do you need that stability of NT4 with the convenience of Windows 95's device manager? Windows 2000 makes your dream come true. Great! Now you are required to have Internet Explorer integrated into your system. This summarizes the dirty practices of Microsoft. They'll give you some things you want, but with that, they'll throw this immeasurable burden on you. We could still be using Windows NT 4.0 today or otherwise some new version that preserves the simplicity of NT 4 while adding support for today's technological necessities like ACPI, GPT partitions, EFI, and NVMe storage. Windows NT was clearly designed to be versatile among multiple architectures. Successive service packs could provide new hardware support or clear functional improvements. Certainly, Service Pack 3 had no trouble adding full support for AGP video cards, and Service Pack 5 added support for SSE instructions without anyone even noticing. So new programs using them could run much faster. Look at how long Windows XP survived, even though its later Service Pack did add noticeable blow to it. Actually, Windows 10's new service model does allow it to keep the same Windows 10 name indefinitely, but major updates now come in the form of completely new builds that can break compatibility with some of your hardware or programs, rather than making simple amendments to the same build that has a solid foundation in place. What is Windows 10 if the initial release is not the same as the Fall Creators update? At the very least, it's a mouthful. I'm not going to pretend Microsoft was benevolent and wishy-washy in the mid-90s, though. They did always play dirty. Windows 95 had a similar problem where there were two unmistakably different versions of it. One being sold to end users on floppies or an upgrade CD-ROM. The other being exclusively aimed at OEMs. And sometimes system builders, if you're good enough to find one. The latter has low-level support for the FAT32's file system, which many large hard disks benefited from. It's also possible to install the USB supplement to this version, which makes a few new, very important hardware interfaces usable, but it's not compatible with the retail version. Given Windows 95 OSR2 was particularly difficult to obtain at the time due to Microsoft's licensing terms for that version, that made it easier for them to push Windows 98 to consumers as the only realistic option for getting that important functionality they want, with a bunch of other dumb shit they don't need shoehorned into there. As technology exponentially advances, bloatware gets worse over time. Suddenly, an entire operating system needs to tie up at least 2 gigabytes of memory at minimum in order to run smoothly, and some programs are now starting to demand more than 8. You'd think by now we've reached an optimal point in computing where even a budget-oriented computer should be able to live up to its marketing stickers on the chassis, where affordable computing can now deliver the high-speed performance you crave. No. Instead, minimum requirements need to be as ever-expanding as the universe so companies can sell you more products every generation and so they can integrate more crapware and useless eye candy into your system using the added power of the new computers. If nobody's going to try making use of 8 gigabytes of RAM themselves, those crapware programs sure will. In the 90s, many computer users dealt with slowdowns from virtual memory swapping constantly, as even 32 megabytes of RAM was considered a luxury up until 1997 or 98 or so. Programmers were forced to implement intelligent memory management or make their programs smaller if they wanted such programs to be comfortable to use among the widest range of users possible, with the exception of AOL. Given how outrageously expensive computers were back then, it was a certainty that many users were going to have under spec computers, perhaps still chugging along with 8 megabytes of RAM at the turn of the new millennium. Realistically, even 1 or 2 gigabytes of RAM should be more than enough for a lot of users, and that's likely being generous. I run Debian 10 on my Hirma development machine and it certainly holds up to modern everyday tasks well 
with a Pentium D and 2 gigabytes of DDR2 RAM, in spite of Mate, Firefox, and or various modern websites trying so hard to hog up my system and cause extended periods of swapping that prevent me from moving the mouse cursor. Unfortunately, one gigabyte of RAM has spelled a dead end in the Windows world since 2007 and two gigabytes a few years later. Since the start of the Windows XP era, the idea of upgrading hardware to extend its longevity to the bitter end has been thrown out in the face of mainstream computing, which explains why so many underpowered Pentium 4 systems end up in thrift stores, like cellular telephones, desktops were treated as disposable goods, anxiously waiting for their rapid death so the next iterations could take their places, the former being replaced at a much faster rate. Around this era, high capacity memory started becoming more attainable for everyone, which should have been enough to liberate users from the virtual memory swapping they bravely endured in the previous decade. Quite the opposite, actually. The internet is no different. Many major websites, not just YouTube, shamelessly inflate their websites with unneeded scripts and clunky user interfaces that are clearly designed with multi-touch screen telephone or tablet users in mind. Yeah, I'm saying that in the most wordy form just to spite the mobile market. As these websites unendingly change their minds on how exactly they want to look, they have a tendency to cut off many of their functions which people want. Unlike with offline software where you could just continue to use Windows 95 forever if you really wanted to, you must always adapt to the newest layout a website has and live with the loss of its previously available features, and you effectively have no say in the course of the website. Cloud computing sucks for this reason, and many more. If websites kept their designs simple and only used whatever scripting was necessary, it would have allowed users to harness the full potential of their broadband connections, which were a salvation from the cumbersome constraints dial-up networking had, even though dial-up does have its benefits here and there. Certainly, the growing availability of broadband made YouTube possible. I'm not sure how I would have gotten by without it, and given how large movies were compared to Flash cartoons on Newgrounds, it is undoubtedly a website that needs such high bandwidth. When bandwidth is wasted on ads and scripts, though, it does nothing to benefit anyone who's not the advertisers or the site itself and only tampers with the experience. We are pretty well aware of today's problems with technology, but unfortunately our noise blends in with the rest of the crowd because hundreds of millions of people are not willing to stand up against corporate arrogance. They have been trained to go with the flow and are defeated by the seemingly dictatorial power of big tech. All we are able to do so far is jump over hurdles that don't need to be in our way, figuring out workarounds to whatever it is one program or site wants to impose on us next. Regarding your reference to the term normie, while it can be useful for the introvert who has such a hard time finding other people who don't conform to mainstream ideologies and interests, it generally fails to acknowledge how so many people got there at once. Why does everyone like these talentless hacks who were effectively manufactured by soulless entities hiring consultants who dictate what is going to be popular for a decade. What makes a movie so worthy of hype despite being owned by an uncontrollably giant corporation that lost its love for art to the point where movies are meant to be put on assembly lines? Is there any fluidity of opinions behind the smog which cable television emits on a minutely basis? Why does everyone I know drink soda when I don't? Public schools, at least in the form I grew up in, are the first thing I'd blame for so many people being complacent with mainstream thought. They don't teach you as much as their image would make you want to believe, and their one-size-fits-all approach to education is a colossal failure in both concept and practice. It was designed to stifle independent thought and disallow the questioning of authority or objection to popular opinions. I'm not joking, this one time a math teacher scolded at least one of us for expressing an unpopular opinion about mm, something. I don't know what it was, but she wanted us to shut up because of it. She just said, no, 
if the opinion is not popular, it's not allowed. Don't say it. That's probably how some people in school get eaten by groupthink, where they can't be honest with themselves on whether they like something or not. Sure, some people may genuinely like something that is mainstream and popular, but how many of them have been exposed to lesser known works of art that may have been created with much greater effort by sandboxing the masses into an environment where all that exists is top-down mainstream garbage, it becomes difficult to open the mind up to other answers even with the internet being readily available to numerous people. I think it goes without saying that many people have picked up on modern phones without running into too many roadblocks, still know the ins and outs of the interface and do a lot of their digital activities on there. That's where it ends all too often though. They don't care passionately enough about what could be done to repair the philosophies of computing. Technology education in public schools is very, very weak. All it does as most is teach you how to use software and program things in clunky or irrelevant languages. Never does it make an attempt to explain the importance of computers or how they could be used to greater potential. You won't be taught how to manage all the fine details of your computer and you most certainly won't be taught anything about older computers in spite of the fact that they can make very good learning resources, especially given that many businesses have mission critical applications which still rely on obsolete hardware and software. Didn't they say school was supposed to prepare students for working in commercial environments? So oh, right, they were only referring to Walmart at best. It sounds unfair to complain about public schools having weak technology education given how recent home computing is compared to other 20th century essentials. Of course, previous generations aren't going to know as much about computers, right? Well, the complacency factor of public schools has always been there, so I'd argue that has preemptively blocked them off from questioning what went wrong with computers all of a sudden. Of course, public schooling is not the only thing promoting complacency with bad technological changes and in general, but it goes hand in hand with other mainstream entities. Until a better education system is put in its place, it can only be up to us to attempt to reintroduce the forgotten philosophies of computing that made it so great to begin with. That's part of the reason why I make videos about computers. I don't just want to have fun with them. I want to show them do things nobody seems to expect from such ancient systems and prove they can still be incredibly powerful simply going by their functionality because that's exactly where they were when they first came out. They may not do any jobs as quickly as a sweet Ryzen build for less than a thousand dollars but they sure as hell were built for intensive tasks. Except the Celerons. I remember when you commented on the 32-bit difference soon after I first published it, saying you learned more watching that video than you did in college. College, a higher level educational institution that's meant to give you the juicy degree for all those whoop-ass paying jobs. And here I was, not taking any higher education, just continuously self-teaching computers as I've always done it. To this day, it still blows my fucking mind that I could somehow teach more in some inconsequential 35-minute VHS tape than a gratuitously expensive four-year education backed by a culture that greatly respects it and a bunch of companies which insist on you having your magical piece of paper. Were you majoring in any sort of technology-related subject? It's very important to remember that so-called normies are human beings that share common struggles with us and suffer through the same things we do. They don't have the disillusionment we have right now, but with patient and continued education involving computing freedom, they too will see through the farces that big tech has set up for all of us. No longer shall the fluidity of thought be controlled by corporate think tanks. As time rolls on, my dream crystallizes into its proper form. Having worked on Hierma so much compared to any other project, I'm getting closer to feeling all more willing to actually take on the task of programming an MS-DOS game and later a Glide compatible game. Not simply something that proves you can still make a compelling adventure for a 166 megahertz system, but that you can do better 
than what many AAA games, which demand new hardware and software, are doing right now. The 8-Bit Guys Planet X3 has proven to be quite a success, which is very encouraging for my own dream project. Ideally, if my project bears the fruit of a victorious program that runs great on a Cyrix 686 and grabs the attention of many who otherwise wouldn't care for such a system, it may be what we need to gain the necessary leverage to open a scar that can actually be felt by the dystopia that is modern computing. Or, you know, everyone can just use DOSBox and carry on with their day. But I'm going to test it on my hoarding of real hardware, and you simply won't get the same experience without it. Surely, something will happen that, at the very least, causes at least one big tech corporation to reconsider their ideology, or tweak it so that users gain back some power, even if it's only a small amount. The important thing to remember is if they do give you back some of your farmland, don't stop there. Keep pushing them to exhaustion until you gain full control over them and then seize the rights to Windows for all of the public to distribute and modify to what they actually want. Windows 95 is great not because of Microsoft, but because it was made in a time where broken computing philosophies were not at their prime while at the same time it was getting to a point where consumer software needed to take better advantage of 32-bit hardware and provide users with an ease of use that was desperately wanted even among the most tech savvy.